Okay, um, welcome back. Um, you did get your two 15-minute coffee breaks in the end, and we've just about caught up, and I hope uh, we'll be able to finish in time to uh, go on the lab tours at 5 o'clock. So in this last session, um, I wanted to talk about actually some of the practicalities of managing uh, the projects. Uh, that's to say the implementation. So structure, systems, processes. You'll need to cover that in the proposal, but it's also important when you're actually managing the project itself. So again, it's, it's basically, at the, end, at the end of the day, the objective is to get the best project outputs and capture the project outputs. Okay? So, again, you, it's, um, it's about delivering, and we have to under understand the landscape, selecting the projects. So, the issue is how we now implement it. So, I'll probably save five minutes on that. Okay, skipping through that. <laughs> so, we're getting there, right? So, it's all about management structures and procedures to enable you to capture and manage the research results, or the foreground IP as it used to be known. So the management framework, you know, who's going to be responsible, the procedures, how it's going to be done, and it's about establishing good foundations and guiding principles and policies so you have the infrastructure there to do it. Um, and IP management and protection strategies and procedures. I mean, general terms. And then the exploitation, once you've captured the results, protected them, it's about how you um, assess the opportunities. Or maybe before you protect it, you just need to assess the opportunities and think about your exploitation strategies and plans. <coughs> so, again, if you look at the criteria, if you're writing your proposal, um, it asks you here about the appropriateness of the management structures and procedures, including risk management, and innovation management. Now, most projects <coughs> seem to have a, a boilerplate uh, project management system because they look remarkably similar between proposals. Uh, and th the common, uh, common thing is their management structures are appropriate. Or maybe they're not appropriate because it's a very large, it's a very small project and you've got a, a heavyweight management structure. But there are a number of things which are not normally addressed and which, if they were addressed, I think you might get a few extra points. So, for example, risk management is always, um, is always brought... It's in the criteria, so people talk about it. And although I'm not, I'm not here to talk about risk management, you could do a lot better than you know, what, what, what often happens. Uh, you know, you need to think about technical risks, management risks. Uh, for each risk, if you're going to do a table, you need to um, think about um, uh, the probability of the risk happening and, it, and the impact, so high, medium, or low. Um, but then what's often missing is the mitigation actions. So what actions are you going to take to try and avoid, prevent that risk happening? And also another column for contingency. So what are you going to do if it happens? So that, that might make a good uh, risk, manage, risk um, table. But what is often missing is the risk management. So how are you going to manage the risk? Are you going to have... You just need... You do have a process on a six-monthly basis or at every yearly project review to review the risks again and maybe look at those risks and indicate whether those risks have gone... The probability of happening or the impact, whether it's gone up or down because halfway through the projects, your risk may change. So what was maybe a very risky thing is now not so risky. So, um, and, and that's risk management. But the other thing is um, innovation management. That's there, and um, people don't understand it necessarily, and they, they, try and c they confuse innovation management with maybe exploitation management or um, IPR management. And so what I'm going to talk about now is, is some of the management structures and procedures that you actually need to think about. And the key issues that you need to think about, um, again, to make your proposal a little bit better, are these, these terms, innovation management, 
IPR management, um, exploitation management, and then you know, what do we mean by impact innovation potential and enhancing innovation capacity. Um, and things like IPR management is, is what Roberta met, mentioned this morning. It, it's, it's to do with managing IP, not just stating what the rules are. So again, innovation management, it isn't IPR management and it isn't exploitation management. Don't, don't confuse them. And what I've tried to, to show here is the trying to encompass what the Commission understands by innovation management. <laughs> so innovation management, what they understand by innovation management is the whole process, right through from you know, deciding what you want to do. Um, and IP management is something different, and exploitation management is something different. And all along this process, someone's got to keep monitoring what's going on, because things change, technologies change. Um, and then we have these terms like innovation potential. So you have your idea, it's a wheel, <laughs> you know, can you say something about the innovation potential for this? Um, and obviously you, you can think of lots of things there. When you deliver your product at the end of the day, I mean up here, what's the innovation capacity? You know, can it be used for other things? And, you know, is it an infrastructure that builds? And of course impact we, we spoke about earlier, the extent of the benefit and the fact that it's meeting needs. So innovation management, this is the commission definition. It's in a little balloon if you look somewhere in your proposal template. Um, it says overall management of all the activities related to understanding the needs, uh, with the ob meet understanding needs with the objective of successfully identifying new ideas and managing them in order to develop new products and services which satisfy the, these needs. So innovation management begins right at the beginning and goes right through. Okay. And so it's understanding the needs and the innovation, you may, need, you may decide you want to have an innovation manager or you may just want to have this work package called innovation management, um, which is done by someone else, it may be the project manager, but there are certain tasks which the innovation manager needs to do. And that includes, as we've just said, understanding the needs. But it's being responsible for the overall strategic approach. You know, continually monitoring the market, um, steering the plan if necessary, after agreement with the project officer, of course, <laughs> if that's necessary. Um, and ensuring that the, the foundations of the project um, and the management processes and, and structures uh, for innovation are sound and working effectively. So. I've sort of described it a bit like this. You've got the, the overall project management and you've got this uh, innovation manager, someone trying to be the navigator and, and steer it. And then you've got the engine room, which are the work packages. And that might include IP manager, exploitation manager. But the innovation manager is how you, how you manage the whole innovation process. And, and that's what is asked for in the proposal template and what's evaluated as a criteria, and I have to say that so far it's not been very well done because no one really understands it. <laughs> so uh, even, th even though they, they put in that definition. So some of the things that the innovation manager might need to do is secure the foundations. So that includes things like the consortium agreement. And again, this could be done by the project manager, but it's part of innovation management. So we have Ensuring the consortium agreement is, is appropriate. Um, agreeing things like before the project starts, IP access usage rights and policies, background, the foreground, background, and during the project. Um, doing, uh, make, make sure IP awareness training for participants. I think that's often overlooked. I think you very rarely see that in proposals. But um, one of the biggest issues for research results is what I would call IP leakage or IP value leakage. People are not aware um, of what they're producing and the potential value, and so they don't treat it properly or look after it. If you think, you know, in industry, in industry, companies produce products or they produce services, but the main output for researchers is intellectual property, um, and that's their key asset that's valuable. But um, they don't really 
fully understand the va potential value of this. So they'll dig up, it's a bit like digging for gold, and you find this shiny object, and they go, oh, shiny object, you know, or here, you know. <laughs> without saying, oh, maybe this is value, I, I ought to go to my tech transfer office, or at least I should disclose it to someone. So IP awareness training is, is quite important, um, so that the people who are producing the results can recognise it, and then maybe go and talk to someone before the value is lost. The other important thing is to ensure good research practice. Um, now, there are good research practice guides and principles, it's a standard, standard thing, but the important point for... Um, as far as IP is concerned, is that you record things like date of invention. Right? Because if it, if it comes late, later on that the, you, know, you have something, be it, be it a copyright material or, or patentable product or design, you need to be able to have it documented, um, who produced it, when did they produce it, contributions from different people maybe. But this is all part of good research practice. So this is stuff that, you, you know, get the foundations right. Now if we look at different management elements, um, IPR management. Again, it's, um, it's something that can be done by the project manager or you could have a separate IP manager. It depends on the size of the project. But this area is, is often not, not covered and the statement is often, you know, these are, these, these are the ownership rules and uh, we'll, we'll, IP manager will be agreed in the consortium agreement. You know, we'll, we'll leave it for later. But the management of the IP, this is about the management of the IP used in the project. And it's uh, about access and usage rights, both before the project start, sorry, for, before the project, meaning, you know, the, the, the rights for use in the project, but also after the end of the project. And again, I think Jörg mentioned it this morning. You need to make sure that if um, someone is making some key you know, database infrastructure or tool available for use in the project to develop a, a, a system, that when it comes to the exploitation, the terms of usage of that are, are understood. Okay, you could just say on fair and reasonable terms, but you probably need a statement from the owner of that background, if it's critical to the exploitation, that they will make it available you know, to, for, for, for the whole project at the end of the project. So thinking about things like that, and also for monitoring the use of third-party components during the project, especially open source components. Um, researchers like to download all sorts of interesting tools while they're, while they're developing things, and uh, <coughs> you, know, you just need to make sure that if they are downloading and using third-party components, um, that the terms of use are appropriate and don't compromise the commercialization. Depends on the open source license agreement, but sometimes that can pollute the final commercialization. So again, the IP manager has to think about things like that. So it's got to Im Im also it includes a, a policy or an, and a, a, a sorry strategy and a plan in order to, to you know based on the policy. So they have to come up with a um, things, for example, like regular reviews of the project outputs in order to stimulate dis disclosure. I mean, you'll find that unless, unless you're going to shake the tree sometimes, it's very difficult for people to... Well, pe people are reluctant or they don't think about disclosing possible new IP. So it may be that you have this an, as an agenda item at the regular review meetings. Maybe as your work package meetings, or you may just have it as a project review meetings, but to stimulate people to... Um, you know, to ask, ask what there is and try and identify the IP. And then having identified it, it's necessary for someone to secure the agreements on who owns it. So who's going to own it, who's going to manage it, what's going to happen. Um, I'll say more about that in a minute. But the, they then have to go on and, talk, uh, and think about um, assessing it. So they've, something's been disclosed, um, you've sorted out the ownership and you know, know who's doing what, then you need to think about how you assess it. What's its value? Is it worth protecting? Um, shall we just disclose it? What are we going to do? So you do things like prior art searches, you know, to look for overlap, um, look at alternative technologies, that, you know, see whether it, 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 it matches with something someone else has done, so you might be able to 
to use enhance your, your exploitation. Okay, so lot, there's quite a lot here for IP management. <laughs> so it, it also includes, as I, I just said, the review, the need for formal protection, and then maybe pre-publication reviews. So the IP manager ought to ensure that when, you know, there's a process in place for uh, assessing IP that's been disclosed, um, sorry, IP that, that is being planned for publication to be reviewed uh, in order to um, prevent uh, premature disclosure for a technical invention. And then, of course, there's the protecting itself. And as we heard today, it's an item that you can include in your budget, uh, the cost for patenting, for example, and securing the IP. So that's a long list of um, things there for, for IP management. Exploitation management um, is, again, slightly different. Um, IP management is about capturing and protecting and gathering the IP and the research outputs. Exploitation management is really the next stage. It's trying to do something with it. So it's the exploitation, which could be either commercial or research. And the tasks that the exploitation manager um, might, might do could be the, you know, it would of course be the preparation of the exploitation research or commercialization strategies and plans, depending on how near the market it is, um, including, I say, the project results as a whole. What you will generally see under exploitation is a table, exploitation table for each of the partners, and each of the partners will write something about how they're going to exploit their results. And very rarely do you get the uh, <laughs> consolidated view of this collaborative project output about how the, the projects are going to be integrated and how they're going to be exploited as a whole and who's going to manage them and how, how you're going to make sure that each of these partners is not going to be treading on each other's toes. So, you know, the exploitation manager needs to manage that um, to coordinate the exploitation plans um, and, again, during the course of the project to prepare more and more detailed exploitation plans. So you start with an exploitation strategy and probably towards the end of the project one of the work items might be an exploitation plan or draft plan. So again, th those are the sort of things and tasks that you might put down for the exploitation manager. And some of the issues that they need to address, and again I'll talk about this more tomorrow, some of the practicalities, you need to understand where you want to go with your exploitation. And that depends on how far down the line you want to go here. Um, again, it depends on the, the state of the output and whether you, you're going to basically go for a licensing strategy or whether you're going to immediately make the technology open access or open source, um, having justified it, because in that case, for example, you might feel exploitation is best served by having a community-based model, for example, and the competitiveness and growth areas for small companies are best served by making this available with, as a community product, open source, so that people can build, use it as a framework or a platform to build value-added services, for example, or products. So it's a strategy. You need to think about that. And as part of that, you, may, you have to decide maybe about, do you need further investment? For example, you could say that in order to do this, we're going to... You know, at the end of the project, we feel that we need to put in place some, some uh, proof of concept plan. So we plan to seek financing for that. Or we're going to, um, we, we feel a startup or spin out is the best route. So, you know, this is only, say, this is only a draft strategy because you've only got 70 pages, most of which will be covered by other things. <coughs> So dissemination and communications is, is different. Um, again, it may be and is generally a different person to the exploitation manager because dissemination and communication activities about, are about telling the world about A, the project, what's going on, communicating the work, but also communicating the project results. And that includes disseminating the results and publishing it as is required once protection is in place, but also 
support to the exploitation because not only do you have to tell researchers about your research results uh, through public scientific publications but you would also maybe have a strategy to support exploitation for targeting industrial events, conferences, where you might come across a lot of potential licensees. So just moving a level below really, that, that was more of a checklist, just some particular issues about capturing and protecting research results. Now, as I said, you know, recognising you know, intellectual property is an asset which, which can have value and it can be traded. And so it's, I think it's really critical that the creators of that asset must be made aware of the value. So they must recognise what they produce and they must know where to go, go next. But this re researchers disclosing the IP is really just the start. So you need a process in place to have an initial disclosure. You can do that proactively by asking at review meetings or you have to, or really should put in place some process whereby people can contact the IP manager should they come up with something. It's a bit like what Tim was saying, what tech transfer offices have to do. You have to keep, you know, let, let researchers know, keep, let them know that you're still, you're still there. Tech transfer offices would do it through, you know, emails, reviews and whatever, and, and the same for the IP manager. Maybe little, little email newsletters or just keep reminding people that you're there. Um, and again, one of the things, important things that the initial disclosure is to clarify ownership and particularly if third parties are involved. And I just want to mention a few hidden traps here. So the um, uh, hidden traps regarding publications and things which might affect patentability. I mean, uh, you're all aware about prior disclosure. Um, but there are a number of things which can pre prevent patentability for technical inventions. Um, novelty, which is premature disclosure, and inventiveness, which is not often thought about. Um, as, you've, uh, as, you, as you know, prior disclosure is not anything not public, sorry, anything is, if things are novel if it's not been previously described or publicly disclosed anywhere in the world. So this is an example to show that you know, patent examiners don't just look at technical publications, they will be working even when they're having a coffee break and reading their comics. So this, this is an invention, this is a patent application um, for a dog, doggy doorbell, so that when your dog wants to come home he can just ring the doorbell. And this was filed some time ago, uh, but you notice here in the prior art that's quoted, it's not just other patents, it's, it's the Beano, <laughs> number 20. <laughs> So the patent examiner was sitting there having his coffee and examining this thing and then he, he read the Beano <laughs> which, uh, and, and we see here that Foo Foo has already come up with this invention <laughs> and, and that, that was cited against that patent so <laughs> um, it, it can be anywhere. <laughs> um, I'll give, give you another example, this is a real example. Um, I used to work for, for BTG which um, used to manage um, a large portfolio of technologies from uh, UK universities. I was there in the 90s and, and one of the technology portfolios it managed was the MRI portfolio, um, which I'll talk about more as a case study tomorrow. But um, at one stage we were in, uh, in litigation with an American company um, who were infringing one of the patents we owned. Um, and during the trial it transpired that what had happened was the original inventors, our, our patentees, were on, on a bus to a conference in the States, a public bus, and sitting in front of them, unbeknown to them, were these people from this company who were listening and taking notes. And the judge ruled that even though it was a confidential discussion, because these guys said, well, it was a private discussion, they shouldn't have been listening, but they, the judge ruled that even though it was a private discussion, it was in a public place. And therefore, it was deemed to be public disclosure. And so that cost us seven million pounds, I think, in legal fees. So it, it's this, you know, this is why researchers need to be aware. We're not trying to stop them publish because, uh, publishing, just to protect it before they, they give it away. 
Um, so common inadvertent disclosures. Um, the ones you know about publishing in the literature too early, posting information onto the internet, uh, but also things like inclusion in a thesis uh, or any other document which is put in a, a publicly accessible place. Most theses, doctoral, masters, are put in the library, the university library, and are accessible um, unless you ask otherwise. And if the PhD student has included something in his thesis before the patent has been filed, then that's regarded as public disclosure. So just w watch out for that, and if necessary, you can put it in a, in a private area that can only be accessible after a confidential agreement has been signed. So uh, just a related question. I mean, what is the expectation of a uh, tech press or department for, <laughs> for a researcher? I mean, uh, a re uh, presumably a researcher will publish lots of papers. Is it expected that each paper should be given to no. the trust or department to have a look with various particular content? Or no. I, th I think you need to use our common sense, because I mean, in, in the UK, it's, it's slightly different in America where, where it's an obligation to disclose, but uh, in most places, uh, disclosures are self-selecting, really. You know, an, an inventor will think he has something which might have value, we hope, because he's been educated and, and come and ask the tech transfer people, and generally a quick 10-minute view will tell you whether it's worth looking at further. Do you know so, do you expect papers editing that? I, I'm trying to support the tech transfer officers here because I don't want them to be overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> with, <laughs> with, <laughs> with things they can't have. Yeah, so I mean, it, you have to, um, I th it's, it's, it's in, in the US, the after Bayer Dole law, there's an obligation for researchers to disclose. So you'll find in the US there are these huge tech tra transfer offices with huge portfolios, most of which is rubbish. <laughs> and Whereas in Europe and in the rest of the world, tech transfer offices rely on um, the inventor disclosing things. So there's a bit of a self-selection, and there's also a bit of that motivation of the inventor to want to get involved that Tim was talking about. And some studies were, were done on pound-for-pound pound return on research investment, and it's about the same between U US and Europe. It's just that the U US has a large volume of things and a small success rate, and in Europe you have a smaller volume, but most of them are higher quality. So I think the key is this education of researchers to, you know, to try and you know, be aware of things that might be valuable. Yeah. So oh, the other thing is oral or written disclosures. With a customer or people come around, so you see posters, you walk around most universities and there are posters, or you go to a conference and people put up posters for poster sessions. So just beware, you know, what you put on that. That's effectively another disclosure. And, and talking or demonstrating with customers and conferences, there have been cases where, where um, you know, you, tech transfer officers advise the guy, you know, yeah, we're going to file a patent. You can, hit, this paper's okay, but don't say this. You know, just, just keep this bit quiet for the moment. But in the flow of the, the conference, when he presents his stuff, just as he was told, and then someone says, but that was really fantastic, Professor Jones. Can you actually tell me how you did that exactly? And they, and they feel very, you know, <laughs> very proud to be asked, and then they go and disclose it all. <laughs> so they need to be briefed a little bit. Um, again, just talking to visitors. Um, I, I've been, um, I often go into sort of common rooms in universities, which are generally open. I'm, I, I go in and I don't sign a non-disclosure. And I guess there are other people in there. But I've been, there have been situations where someone wants to discuss a potentially patentable invention. So you go to the university and they say, OK, come on, let's, we'll talk about it over coffee. <laughs> and so you get wheeled into this public place, cafeteria, and they start disclosing the invention. And you have to say, hang on, you know, I just think about the bus. <laughs> it, it's, um, but these, these are all in, inadvertent. I mean, they're not meant to be scare stories. It's just more to raise awareness and to amongst the creators of the IP. The other one here is um, where researchers often shoot themselves in the foot. This is partly re good research practice, writing papers. Um, the European Patent Office guidelines for inventiveness or non-obviousness says the term obvious means that which does not go beyond the normal progress of technology um, but merely follows plainly or logically from the prior art. Something which doesn't involve the exercise of any skill or ability beyond that to be expected of the person skilled in the art. Well, unfortunately, researchers are very logical and they're very, 
you know, they, they like to think it's uh, very good. So the, these are real statements from court cases. The names have been changed, but these have been used by the, as, as evidence that the invention is not valid because it was not inventive. And these come from papers that have been written by the inventor, right, soon after the, the invention was published. And uh, they'll say things like, Smith and Jones did so and so, therefore we thought we, you know, we decided to try this. Or because of its structure, the virus seemed a likely choice. Or we predicted it would happen, aren't we clever? And it did. <laughs> and I shot myself in the foot for that, because it's logical. You know. Logic dictates that. So the, these are common terms that are used in papers. And um, you just need to be aware of them, or, or researchers need to be aware of them, be because that could, sh you know, even though they've not disclosed it, they've sort of made it sound, not ob sound obvious. So beware of these sort of hidden traps. Now the other big issue um, is ownership. Um, so the legal ownership of European Commission funded projects is with the institution, the legal entity. Okay? So e even, in, even in Sweden and Italy, the legal ownership is with the institution. The institution may choose to do something later. but. Um, in general, institution involvement is actually crucial, particularly for things like IP ownership and access. And I would encourage you know, proposers to make sure they check things out with the tech transfer office before they start making claims in their proposal about, you know, we will give it away or we, will, we have an open source policy or whatever. Um, so try and involve your institution's knowledge transfer office or rather that you knowledge transfer people involved, <laughs> try, and, try and stick your oar in, because it's not only um, this ish legal issue about ownership, but the tech transfer office yeah. would generally have a lot of experience on the exploitation, IP management, and all those issues, and you could contribute quite a lot to the proposal. So ownership. As we said, what tends to happen, and what's put in most projects are the EC default rules. They say who owns what, so it says who creates it will own it, and if it's jointly created, then it will be jointly owned, and that's the default. And then we'll decide the rest in the consortium agreement on a case-by-case -case basis. But what's usually missing um, are how you work out the relative contributions. Mm -hmm. right, so if, if the default position is 50-50, if I've contributed 10% to this project and 90%, I'll I think I might just say, no, I'll, no, I'm not going to agree to 10%. And we have a standoff. And, you know, I want 50%. Why should I accept 10%? So there needs to be a process in place within the proposal to say something like, you know, the uh, joint inventors will mutually agree, you know, what the relative contributions are. And if they, if they don't agree, then we have a process in place. So it'll go maybe the strategic advisory board or someone will, someone independent will make a judgment based on the evidence that the parties present or something like that. So at least there's a process. So if there's no judgment, you ask them, well, present your case. You know, in my experience, in most cases where there's joint ownership, even within an institution, it's all very amicable. It's not an issue. Um, and they generally agree 50-50, 70-30 or whatever. But it's good to have the process in place. And it gives you another additional tick box on your IP management. Um, then the other question is, who's going to manage? Um, as we said before, you know, is there going to be a central manager for the project consortium? Or are you just going to let each institution do its own thing? You know, how's it going to be managed? Who's going to pay for the protection costs if there's a patent? Or who's going to ma maintain it? Because obviously the commission will reimburse. But who's going to pay for the protection costs? And how are those costs going to be shared if it's joint? And how will revenue be shared? So, for example, if one institution, and this may be after the end of the project, so the commission might pay for the initial filing, but as you go along, um, one institution might agree to manage it and pay for the, pay for the costs um, and may, maybe do the marketing and try and license it. Um, but even though the, the uh, contributions were 50-50, because one partner is contributing much more through the patent costs and the marketing and commercialization, they may share the revenue slightly differently, maybe 70-30 or whatever's agreed. So all of this processes for doing this 
need to be in there somewhere. So before any project starts, I think it's a good idea to agree your ownership policies and procedures. So how are your contributions going to be, be agreed? Do you have any revenue cost and sharing models? Um, and in particular, the main thing I think is to have agree these processes to re resolve conflicts. For example, um, protection in certain territories. If the manager decides, I'm not going to file patents in Japan, I'm not going to continue in Japan, does that mean another partner can, who thinks they should? That should they be allowed, you know, to have the option to, to take it back and manage it in Japan? And so on, you yeah, know, so... Uh, the other thing uh, you should think about is how you handle visitors. And again, this is a general thing for tech transfer people. Um, there ought to be some IP policies um, that you have are agreed by the non-staff or people who might become in involved in the project who aren't automatically employees of the university or the institution. Because if they're not employed by the institution, they're not bound by the rights. So someone comes in and very often, you know, for example, taught research students are not generally covered by um, IP ownership rules. Um, Oxford, Tim mentioned there that it said all students. That's very unusual, and I'm not sure it's... I think he must mean postgraduate students. Because I think in the UK, because the students are paying a fee, you can't claim IP ownership. And, you know, and people, therefore, sometimes people, you'll get a third-year student coming to work on this project. And so you just need to make sure that if they're doing that, they sign a, have an assignment. Um, visiting academics, they turn up all over the place. <laughs> and, uh, you know, without, they just turn up and they might be, you might be chatting and talking to them and contributing. And we've, we've had a case here at Oxford Brooks where one, one of our professors was, was working in, a, in another country, just visiting, um, and contributed to some invention. We knew nothing about it until the institution approached us and said, ah, so-and-so, we're about to file a patent on this, and one of your academics contributed to it. Would you, um, you, know, would you like to um, include it in, uh, have a revenue share? <laughs> you, you know, so it was quite out of the blue. And you know, it turns out he was there visiting, he made some comments and, which contributed to this invention, and the institution on the other side of the world, you know, were filing a patent and they were very honest and told us. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that's, that's very good of them. <laughs> but these things can happen. Advisory board members, you know, in the same sort of thing where, where a researcher goes and makes a suggestion or, you know, makes, contributes to an invention, an advisory board member who is not an employee of the, of the university or, you know, they, they need to, their rules of engagement need to be clear if they're giving advice on the project. So just think about things like that. So I seem to have caught up more than <laughs> I was hoping to, but that, that will give you more. That will give you more beer time. So ju just really to summarise um, most of this morning, really, you know, the impact and innovation needs to be addressed in all three sections of the proposal, not just the impact section. Um, and it's fundamental to understand the landscape, that's the research technical market, in order to provide the evidence and the intelligence for you to justify everything. Right? Because again, as I said, one of, the, one of the common phrases is not adequately justified. <laughs> so, you know, justifying what you're saying with evidence is important. Um, and then, making sure that procedures are in place to actually manage and capture the results and the IP. Because um, without that you won't, won't be able to you know, exploit. And basically nothing in isolation, they're all uh, IPR, exploitation, dissemination, communications. They're all closely dependent on each other and they all rely on a general understanding of, of the wider landscape. And they're all part of th this bigger innovation management thing which the Commission wants, to, wants you to do. So, thank you. Any questions? Um, I'm working for the Dutch Patent Office and advising uh, SMEs uh, when they collaborate. And we also mostly advise them 
to avoid joint ownership of patents. Yeah. Because 20 years you're married to each other. Yeah. I, I, I would ag agree. I, I think people make a lot of fuss. Yeah, pe people make a, make a lot of... It's very emotional ownership <laughs> because it's their baby. But um, I don't think ownership is not necessarily the main issue. I think it's uh, having one person managing it and it's cost sharing and revenue sharing. You know, it's, um, and having a, having a flow back mechanism if you know, the person who's the one person who's looking after it decides not to continue to have an option to, to give it back or to do something. So, um, but, but it's a real problem if you have two people trying to commercialise or do something but the same thing. And I've got some examples tomorrow of, of how that can be a problem and how it, you know, collaborating is much better. Um, even if it's um, you know, the other one person exclusively licensing rather than assigning. But yeah, it, it's emotional thing ownership and it shouldn't be. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Or? And the idea of uh, innovation, or the concept of innovation management and this innovation manager. In many cases, if it's somebody who's supposed to detect the needs of the market or of other researchers or whatever, and then steer the, the project towards um, fulfilling these needs. I mean, in the world of research, there's often a lot of groups uh, looking into the same problem, researching yeah. the same problem. And it's very probable that, that some research results might come from another group during the course of the project, which would make the results that you're trying to, yeah. to achieve kind of pointless. Yeah. So to me, uh, if they're going to introduce this concept and this figure, um, they should be flexible on, on, uh, on project contracts being changed yeah. or even finished early. Yeah. But I don't think, from what I've heard, in and Horizon 2020, they're going to, they want to avoid amendments. They want to have less amendments, but this figure of innovation manager would seem, or management, would seem to mean there should be more. I, I think what, what yeah, um, I mean, they've introduced this concept of innovation management, which is the whole process. And, you know, within that, there's IP management, exploitation management, and all those things. It could be the same person, you know, by, you know it doesn't have to be a different person. But those are the tasks. And um, I mean, the commission does, you know, you can change project objectives, but you have to justify it and agree it. And I think both um, project partners would be reluctant to terminate their project <laughs> if, if, um, if it's become redundant. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure. But, it, but changing it slightly because things have happened might be a possibility or agreeing to work with the other group. I mean, it's quite common that different research groups are working on the same thing because you're all addressing the same challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I'd heard from project officers, though, that in Horizon 2020 they wanted less amendments because they said there's too many. I'm not aware. I know, I know that the, um, yeah. Yeah, they try to make, make things shorter and quicker and easier. And it wouldn't be subject yeah. to an amendment. I mean, it maybe you could also address the issue of risk and contingency planning, because some of the risks are mm. definitely addressing all so yeah. new knowledge, site ground coming mm. up, coming up yeah. new project implementation, and mm. you should have a plan B to look yeah. for that. And that's also mm. something which you have to address in the proposal. Yes, case. yeah. Yes, so, so there, are, you know, there are technical risks and you know, how you'll deal mm. with it. So if you think there's a risk, having done your landscaping, you notice the Americans are doing the same sort of thing. You know, just, you know, what, what if they do what you're doing and makes yours redundant? Do you, do you have a mitigation strategy? Maybe work with them <coughs> so that you're complement, maybe that would be your mitigation strategy to, to liaise closely with the other groups. Uh, but yeah, but yeah I, th I think the Commission wants to do less and less work, doesn't it, on, the <laughs> on, the, on amendments and things, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um. so you had a, I, I was interested in the kind of slide that you showed about ownership. I mean, you have to try to say it's joint owned by the people who jointly created it. And you mentioned that that's actually by default the institution, not the actual employees of the institution. Yeah, the, the ownership is with the legal entity who signed the contract. The question Which I had was that we have kind of looked at two cases where a the some of the institutions that we work with do not have kind of con employment contracts where you know they have taken over the IP ownership from the employee. 
and in second cases where actually those entities are government ministries where you can't even do that. So, so I think the default position is with the institution and I think in some, in some Nordic territories the in, when it, it, it comes to you know, talking to the institution about ownership and sorry about legal issues then they may choose to waive their rights or to assign, you know, waive their rights in favour and then you talk to the in academic. I, I had a case where the, it was a collaborative thing with a, a Danish company, a UK company and a Finnish uh, institution, so a UK institution, these are all academic institutions and um, th there was a commercialisation opportunity and we had a potential licensee but then it got complicated because the Finnish institution had assigned it to the inventor and the inventor had left the Finnish institution and moved to a Swedish institution <laughs> and all the ownership and legal things got very, very messy <laughs> but um, essentially you're talking to the legal owner and it may be that it's been assigned, the institution might have assigned it um, but I don't think it's the other way, I don't think they, the, the ownership doesn't automatically rest with the individual even though the national law might say for government funded, Swedish government funded uh, projects the ownership is with the professor or um, I'm not sure, there, there have been some changes I think in recently in Finland and Sweden not in Sweden? No, they rejected it. And I think in Finland, I think, <coughs> was it Denmark? I thought fin Finland, they, it's a half and half, I think. So maybe patents belong to, but anyway, it it's, can be complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I'm actually heard the Danish preference in terms of who the legal ownership should remain with. I don't think it has any preference. I mean, there's the legal thing, yeah. No, I, no, the, own, the ownership is with the entity that created it. Mm. That's all. Yeah, and then after that, you can, if you want to assign it to the SME or license it for a particular field of use and then license it to someone else, then it's up to you to decide how to do it. Yeah. 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 There, there are other rules which are they a bit more flexible to do with um, exclusive exclusivity and assignment. But uh, just a couple of comments. Really. I had some experience of professors' privilege of commercialising technology in partnership with a university that has professors' privilege, and it really causes an awful lot of problems. I would say to anyone before you get into that. <laughs> <laughs> think about it, because if we've got a situation where academics individually own it, number one, they don't tend to want to actually put the money in to even support the IP protection as one is. So what uh, you said before makes a lot of sense. It's, um, see, it's interesting that this, um, this institution ownership um, started in the state of Beidol, where the, the Americans said, oh, we can't, you know, it, um, you know, let, let, let's, let's give it to the institutions, they can manage the IP. In, in the UK, the NRDC, National Research Development Corporation, which was the world's first tech transfer office, uh, was founded in 1948. And that had the role of managing all the IP um, for the whole of government funded research in the UK, which then eventually became you know, um, BTG after the government, Thatcher government followed the Bay Dole Act. And lots of people are looking at the American model and saying, ah, oh, institution ownership, that's the way to go. And um, there's been that trend. But interestingly, not in you know, the Nordic countries, um, some areas. And interestingly, they've stayed with professors' privileges and they consistently come out at the top of the innovation rankings. <laughs> so I don't quite know what the lesson is there, but you, you know, I think it's... And there's a good innovation infrastructure as well you know, with support, support groups and innovation ecosystems. But, but yeah, it's down to the professor being willing. The point yeah. of the joint ownership is it, it, it would be, in an ideal world, best to have one owner, but it's not always possible. And there are, it's not purely an emotional thing, there are very good reasons for wanting to be, be an owner. I had you know, a lot of experience in, in doing it. Yes, there are problems. But I consider it as part of the job to have to deal with those problems as long as you have agreements to manage that. 
So, you know, in, this is a lot for people to say, we only want one or but when it comes out in practical terms of negotiating, you will find that you won't actually achieve that. I, th I think the key... Yeah. Yeah. I think the key issue is who manages it and who, you know, you don't tread on each other's toes. You can have joint owners and each one looking at a different market sector or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, the other thing is that joint ownership can be within a same institution, or it can be different. No, no, no. The, the ownership's the institution. That's inventors, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you very often have several inventors, yeah. I think it's rather a question to the audience because we have been talking a lot about the extended role of TTOs in Horizon 2020 and, and I'm wondering whether at some universities they have already a well-established procedure whenever a scientist is going to apply for a proposal that the TTO staff is somehow involved. I know from a few universities if you want to see any proposal submitted to Horizon 2020, I think it's not the case in the majority of the <laughs> majority of the universities. It's mostly the, the stuff in the European Project Office or dealing with that. Or do we have any well established procedure here that there is a kind of automatic check? No, I think I think in some small institutions the research office is closely located to the tech transfer office, but I'm not sure there's any former, yes. formal sort of link. No, yeah. the only time it's happened in the past is when you have a savvy mm. academic yeah. who, who has either previously patented or is bringing a patent in, and, and so he's therefore aware who will raise the issues. Um, but the real challenge, whether you're um, working in a, a, a European support team or a TTO, is that unfortunately, the people who have these discussions are the academics. And they have those discussions in bars and worse places than that. Like, yeah, well, we'll do it together. Yeah, it's fine, well, we'll do that. Da, 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 da. They have a little meeting where they agree what they're going to do. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. No, no, and we'll pay the, yeah, yeah. And what they're doing is they're committing on behalf of the institution. And they're not actually able to do that. But of course, then we get to hear about it four days before. <laughs> you know, either the, the, the um, application goes in, or yet worse, when I'm being badgered, can you sign it? Can you any fact it? What is this? <laughs> oh, it was all agreed months ago with some coordinated service. <laughs> well, not by me. Yeah. And this, this, you know, whichever field you're in, that is the biggest, I think that's an even bigger problem than, um, than this morning's elephants. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Should go to bars. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask a question, maybe an open question about uh, access rights, background, foreground, IP, in, when you've got a project which involves creation of software and source code. Should source code be made available? Because, because I've, I've seen quite often an exemption to say that yes, you can have access to background, foreground, IP, but you're not having source code. Which meant, and with, with academic software means what? You know, should, should, oh, should, if access rights are given to software, should that include the source code? Well, I mean, that's up to the. I mean, it, that's up to the whoever's delivering it. It's yeah. Being created. If you've got a platform, an architecture platform, and you're allowing version seven to to this big group for that, um, but actually that 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 architecture is also licensed to, you know, hundreds of people for money. Then actually, I'm not giving you the source code because it's taken eight years and lots and lots of money to get this 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 architecture to the stage that it's at. So no, you're not having it. within the project. I mean, that, that's a that's an IP that's a policy decision for the project. I was about IP policy. If you want, you know, the output to be open source, and and I say open source is just another is just another license. I mean, it's it's just a license to which you can have terms. You can you can disclose the source code or you can't, you know, you, you define what you're licensing or making available. Um, but if the source code is needed, then there has to be some, some yeah, agreement. Need for the project, project. That, yeah. That's standard access rights anyway. Yeah. It's needed for the project. Yeah. Then there, there's another issue with software, because software can lead to hardware, for example, VDL or very low codes. They're, they're not programming to anything with this. But compile it and get hardware out of it. So is that how, I mean, how do you differentiate? For example, VHDL or yeah. very low code. 
So yeah, that's, that's, that's potentially hardware design. Yeah, but that's covered by copyright. So when you license the VHDL... The hardware it produces is intellectual that, property. Yeah, that's separate. Yeah. That's a separate entity. Yes. And that hardware, for example, in, in, in the case you might be thinking about, <coughs> is actually covered by a patent. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, you know, the VHDL... It protects the hardware, doesn't it? It automatically protects the software as well. Um, Software is, is different protection. The software is, is copyright. So if you license, if, if you have this hardware design and you want to license it to someone, you'd license them the, uh, the VHDL code and you'd give them a source listing and they would then produce a, a piece of hardware which is covered by a license under the patent because the patent says um, hardware device produced using this technique. You know, digital circuit produced and that's covered by a patent. So they're, they're different things, and, uh, and they both are protected in different ways. So you have to choose how you want to give it away. <laughs> John, so one more point that you have to be careful about what you import in. For example, if you import a GPL mm. as a background, then you are forced to release a source. Yeah. That, that's what I was saying. That it, what, an important job, especially amongst, you know, a lot of researchers like to just download tools, and they download source code, and they don't really check what the license is. And it may be some sort of viral license, which is going to impact commercialization. So again, you have to, um, and these things happened. I have a case where you know you get to the point of signing it, or or you agree agree some terms, and you, as part of the due diligence, you say, can you please sign this to confirm that you've, you know, that you've not used any third-party software? And they say, oh, I did download some, download something from UCL, <laughs> and you look into it and find it's a little module which is GPL. So then you have to take it out and rewrite it and. Um, we did the same thing with Jeff Express. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, usually in the, in the consortium agreements, uh, there's in some templates a standard that you actually have to have approval before bringing anything up. So yeah, so that's the sort of process that, that you're. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's managing it, though, because they you know. Can I just it's just going off piece, though. My work uh, essentially uh, with SMEs. Uh, on behalf of the Commission. And there's certainly been some debate back at the office as to whether this aspect of novelty, whether we should actually contact the company prior to meeting with them and warn them if there is any uh, intellectual property to be discussed, that they sent a copy of an NDA in advance of that meeting. Is that something you have any view on or experience of? Well, I think having an NDA is, is always... Always, always useful, and it protects both parties. And you know, some com big companies actually won't sign an NDA just because it may c compromise work they're already doing. So, um, but yeah, you should. Um, if there's any any risk of, you know. I just wonder about any reason that wasn't policy. Um, and I wonder if there was this uh, unfortunately the role. No, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's good practice. I don't know whether it's policy. It's, uh, we are learned. Also, be beware of NDAs because, I mean, the terms could say basically that you can't, once, once we've discussed this, you can never do anything with this again. You can't, so you, you can't research this idea, you can't yeah. develop it. That's that's how I so, so be extremely careful with what you're assigning. Yes. Whose NDA is it? Is it the universities? Is it the SMEs? And then at my level, I'm not able to sign the NDA. So it causes uh, one heck of a delay in meeting with our client. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that I understand to protect their interests why it's necessary. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the reason why big companies very often won't do that, because they, they probably have work, or may well have work. And then once you've dis they've discussed it, then you're in trouble. But the NDAs can be bilateral um, as well. The problem is if you get a, um, a, a, a TTO person to sign an NDA, then actually it means they can't do their job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, um, they can, therefore can't talk to venture, venture capitalists or, or to any other kind of investor. Um, so you, you have to be careful as to when, you know, you, I mean, a confidentiality agreement for a discussion is one thing, um, but then you, it, you have to have very clear kind of terms as to on what terms that is revoked and when you know. It's a very good point. So that then as you go, yeah, I'm not going to tell anybody until, okay, now we've got a deal. Now I can tell everybody and, and you have to make that clear. Otherwise, you end up 
legally not being able to actually do any of the things that the SME needed to do. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So. Thank you. Time for two of us. Thank you.